the serene expanse of Colorado's rugged landscapes, the tale of Michelle Ray Vinick unfolds, a narrative that has captivated the imaginations of many and left an indelible mark on the community of outdoor enthusiasts. Michelle, at 35 years of age, epitomized the spirit of adventure and the profound love for the natural world. A mother to four children, she balanced her family's responsibilities with an unwavering passion for the outdoors. Climbing and hiking were not just hobbies for Michelle, they were essential threads woven into the fabric of her identity, ways to immerse herself in the tranquility and majesty of nature's offerings. Her love for adventure led her to seek challenges that would push her limits and to allow her to experience the exhilaration of conquering nature's formidable peaks. Yet, it was her underlying spirit of exploration that set the stage for a journey from which she would not return. On September 24th of 2005, Michelle, accompanied by her friend Eric Sawyer, set out to ascend Mount of the Holy Cross. This mountain, standing as a sentinel with its elevation of 14,005 feet, presents a formidable challenge even to the most seasoned hikers. It is a peak that has etched itself into the lore of Colorado, not just for its daunting height, but also for the natural cross that adorns its facade, a feature that has intrigued and inspired countless souls. The day of their expedition dawned with promise, yet... It harbored an underlying mystery that would soon engulf Michelle's fate in the shadows. As they embarked on their ascent, the air was filled with anticipation of the climb ahead, a year-long dream finally coming to fruition. Little did they know, this journey would etch Michelle's name into the records of unsolved mysteries, her story becoming a haunting testament to the unpredictability of nature and the human spirit's quest to conquer it. As a triathlete, Michelle had conditioned her body and mind to endure, to overcome, and to triumph, whether on the track, in the water, or against the incline of a mountain trail. Her love for the outdoors was matched by her enthusiasm for climbing, a hobby that brought her not just physical gratification, but a deep connection to the natural world. This connection was something she sought to share and celebrate with those around her, a shared experience that brought her closer to friends and family alike. Eric Sawyer, Michelle's climbing partner on that fateful expedition, stood as a contrast and a complement to her adventurous spirit. An experienced climber, Eric had successfully navigated numerous summits, his resume boasting a sense of 38 of Colorado's storied 14ers. His relationship for Michelle was grounded in a mutual respect for the mountain and a shared ambition to conquer it. Together, they had planned this climb for over a year, a testament to their dedication and the trust they placed in each other's abilities and judgments. Their dynamic was one of mutual encouragement and support, a partnership that promised to carry them to the summit of Mount of the Holy Cross. With Eric's experience and Michelle's athleticism, they approached the challenges with confidence, unaware that the journey would unfold into a narrative steeped in mystery. On the morning of September 24, 2005, Michelle, Ray Vanek, and Eric Sawyer geared up with the essentials for their ambitious climb. They were poised at the threshold of a journey that would etch this date into the chronicles of the unexplained. Their target was the Mount of the Holy Cross, a formidable giant among the Colorado Rockies, revered not only for its daunting elevation, but also for the natural crucifix that it bore, a beacon for climbers and seekers alike. However, the day's promise was shadowed by a series of initial missteps that would later haunt the narrative of Michelle's mysterious disappearance. Despite their meticulous planning, Michelle and Eric inadvertently set off on the Halo route, a decision that steered their expedition towards unforeseen challenges. Renowned for its rigorous demands and treacherous terrain, the Halo route was not what they had intended to confront. Yet, faced with the realization of their mistake, they pressed on, driven by a year's worth of anticipation and the unyielding allure of the summit that laid ahead. As they ascended, the mountain revealed its merciless nature. Michelle, despite her athletic prowess and triathlete conditioning, found herself grappling with the altitude's unforgiving grasp. The thin air began to exact its toll, manifesting in headaches and a fatigue that clung to her steps, each breath becoming a battle for equilibrium. 
The pair reached a critical juncture when, just 400 yards from the summit, the mountain's invisible weight became insurmountable for Michelle. With the peak almost within reach, she made the harrowing decision to halt her ascent. Her body and spirit had given in to the altitude's relentless force. Eric, faced with his partner's distress and the summit's call, found himself at a crossroad of loyalty and ambition. After a moment of contemplation, he chose to pursue the final stretch alone, leaving Michelle to wait amidst the boundaries that speckled the mountain's face. The decision marked the last known sighting of Michelle, a moment frozen in time, where words and glances were exchanged, unaware of their finality. Eric pressed on to the summit, leaving behind not just Michelle, but the last known evidence of her presence on the mountain. The silence that followed was profound, preserving its secrets with Michelle's fate within its embrace. As Eric ascended the remaining distance, the mystery of what lay ahead was overshadowed by the mystery of his friend that he left behind. As Eric descended from the summit, the triumph of reaching the peak was swiftly overshadowed by a growing sense of unease. The agreed-upon rendezvous spot, where he expected to find Michelle waiting, was hauntingly empty. His calls for Michelle, carried by the wind, met with no response but the mountain's indifferent silence. With each step that failed to reveal her presence, Eric's concern deepened into alarm. The realization of Michelle's absence spurred him into immediate action, retracing their path in a frantic search that only confirmed his worst fears. Michelle had vanished. The gravity of the situation prompted Eric to alert the authorities, sending into motion a search and rescue operation that would quickly escalate into one of the largest in Colorado state history. Within hours, the serene wilderness of Mount of the Holy Cross became the epicenter of a massive human effort to unravel a mystery that the mountain seemed determined to keep. Rangers, officers, and helicopter crews were deployed. The community's response was overwhelming, with hundreds of volunteers joining the search, driven by a collective resolve to bring Michelle home. Despite the extensive resources mobilized, helicopters scouring from above, ground crews combing through the rugged terrain, and scent dogs tracing every possible trail, the mountain yielded no clues to Michelle's whereabouts. The initial absence of any trace was perplexing. No backpack, no shoes, no signs of distress. The mountain, vast and impenetrable, seemed to have swallowed her whole, leaving behind a silence that echoed with unanswered questions. This bewildering lack of evidence only deepened the mystery of Michelle's disappearance, casting a shadow over the exhaustive efforts of the search team. As days turned into weeks, the hope that had driven the operation faced the relentless reality of the mountain's secrecy. The Mount of the Holy Cross, for all its majestic beauty, held its secrets tightly, leaving those searching for Michelle to ponder the unfathomable. How could someone vanish so completely in the presence of so many determined to find her? As the search for Michelle intensified, the mountain began to yield fragments of a narrative, each more mysterious than the last. Two days into the exhaustive efforts, searchers stumbled upon an unsettling clue, a duffel bag and a shotgun, abandoned and seemingly out of place in the wilderness that Michelle had vanished into. This discovery prompted a ripple of speculation among the search teams and the wider community, introducing a sinister undertone to the already mystifying circumstances of her disappearance. In another unexpected twist, reports surfaced of a man who seemed to shun contact with others, choosing instead to conceal himself behind trees, refusing the calls of others to show his face. This bizarre behavior only added layers to an unfolding mystery, leaving more questions in its wake. The presence of this elusive individual in the vicinity of Michelle's last known whereabouts added a human element to the speculation surrounding her fate, a factor that complicated the narrative of a simple disappearance and introduced the possibility of foul play. Amid the sprawling search operation, another chilling discovery was made. Traces of blood in the snow, the blood, found without any discernible context or explanation, became a focal point of speculation. The absence of follow-up analysis on its origin left a gaping hole in the investigation, a piece of the puzzle that remained frustratingly out of reach. Was this blood connected to Michelle, or was it an unrelated anomaly in the wilderness? 
the lack of definitive answers only served to deepen the mystery in this case. The search also brought a man to light named Peter Martin. Encountered by the search teams, Martin's demeanor was marked by resistance and evasion, his unwillingness to engage raising suspicions among those involved in the rescue efforts. His presence on the mountain, coupled with his obscure behavior, cast him as a figure of intrigue in the narrative of Michelle's disappearance. The search team's interaction with Martin were fraught with unanswered questions. Each of these discoveries, the abandoned items, the fleeting encounters with a man in the shadows, the unexpected blood, and the mysterious Peter Martin wove together a narrative of clues and suspicions. Yet, for all their potential significance, they failed to illuminate the fate of Michelle on that September day. Instead, they stood as cryptic signs in the wilderness. In the wake of the clues and the absence of concrete evidence, theories and speculations swirled around the disappearance of Michelle. The community and authorities alike grappled with various scenarios, each attempting to piece together the fragments of the story that the mountain refused to relinquish. One prevailing theory was foul play, a notion that gained traction with the discovery of the shotgun and the encounters with individuals whose behavior seemed to defy innocent explanation. This theory suggested that Michelle might have stumbled upon something or someone with malicious intent, leading to a tragic outcome. The presence of the unidentified man and the mysterious Peter Martin in the vicinity where Michelle vanished added fuel to these speculations, suggesting a sinister human element at play in the wilderness. Another line of speculation pointed toward an accidental death due to natural elements. The rugged and unforgiving terrain of Mount of the Holy Cross, coupled with Michelle's reported struggles with altitude and fatigue, suggested a scenario in which she might have succumbed to the harsh conditions. This theory contemplates the possibility that Michelle, disoriented and weakened, may have fallen or suffered a fatal injury, her location obscured by the dense wilderness and the mountain's vast expanses. Investigators, sifting through the evidence and weighing the theories, lean towards the likelihood of Michelle encountering a fatal mishap caused by the natural challenges of the mountain. Without conclusive evidence, the narratives woned by community members, authorities, and the media serves as attempts to make sense of a situation that defies easy explanation. In a dramatic turn of events nearly two decades after Michelle Ray Venick vanished without a trace, a weathered hiking boot was discovered in the wilderness south of Vale, casting new light on the enduring mystery of her disappearance. The boot, identified as Michelle's, was found propped against a boulder, its leather ravaged by time and the elements, yet unmistakably hers, purchased just a day before her ill-fated hike. This solitary piece of evidence, the first tangible clue after years of speculation and search efforts, reignited interest in the case. For years, the prevailing theory suggested that Michelle, overcome by altitude sickness and exhaustion, might have strayed off course, leading to a fatal accident in an area far from the initial search zones. However, the location of the boot, found in an area where few venture, north of the summit and below a rocky slope, suggested a different trajectory entirely. This revelation has led to a reassessment of Michelle's likely path on the day that she vanished. It now appears that, contrary to the belief that she might have headed west after getting lost, Michelle likely ventured north, attempting to navigate her way back via a route that her and her climbing partner had not planned to take. The boot's location, far from the originally speculated areas, indicates that Michelle might have been trying to follow a trail-like feature down the mountain, mistakenly believing it to lead to safety. Instead, it led her into terrain that was, unbeknownst to her, seldom traveled and fraught with danger. The implications of the boot's discovery extend beyond the mere fact of its finding. They challenge the understanding of Michelle's movements and decisions in her final hours. Investigators now theorize that Michelle, disoriented and likely in a state of physical distress, inadvertently ventured into a perilous and isolated area of the mountain. This new understanding provides a critical piece of the puzzle in reconstructing the sequence of events that led to her disappearance, offering her family and those who have followed the case a semblance of closure, yet also deepening the mystery with new questions about her last steps. The effect of Michelle's disappearance extends beyond her immediate circle, touching the hearts of the wider community of outdoor enthusiasts and climbers. 
Her story intertwines love for the natural world with the imperative of caution and respect for its challenges. The story of Michelle Ray Vinick, marked by unresolved mysteries, continues to resonate, a somber testament to the allure and peril of the mountains that she loved. It beckons us not only to remember her, but also to learn from her story, to ensure that the spirit of adventure is always approached with an unwavering commitment to safety. In light of the ongoing mystery surrounding Michelle's fate, there is a continuous call to action for anyone who might hold information, however seemingly inconsequential. We encourage you to come forward, and the Eagle County Sheriff's Office remains the primary contact point for tips or insights that could lead to a breakthrough in the case. Their commitment to uncovering the truth stands as a beacon of hope for resolution and closure to what happened to Michelle. In the heart of Yellowstone's untamed wilderness stood the Grand Fountain Hotel, a beacon of elegance and luxury in the summer of 1900. Surrounded by the park's breathtaking landscapes, the hotel was a symbol of human achievement amidst nature's majestic beauty. It attracted travelers far and wide, eager to experience the comfort it offered in the midst of the wild. Into the scene of refinement stepped Leroy R. Piper, a 36-year-old visitor from Ohio. With a demeanor quieter than the lively guests around him, Piper seemed almost an enigma. His eyes held a depth that suggested a man on a quest, not just through the vast park, but perhaps a journey within himself. Yet no one could have guessed his arrival at the Fountain Hotel would soon weave his name into one of Yellowstone's most enduring mysteries. Inside the walls of the Fountain Hotel, luxury reigned supreme. Polished wooden floors shone under the warm lights of chandeliers, while guests with their finest attire filled the grand hall with laughter and animated discussions. They shared tales of the day's adventures, from sightings of bison herds to the mesmerizing eruption of geysers, creating a lively atmosphere of excitement and wonder. Amid this vibrant social scene, Leroy R. Piper made his entrance, his presence contrasting with the exuberance around him. With a quiet grace, he navigated through the crowds, a solitary figure among groups of animated guests. His demeanor was reserved, almost reflective, as if he were a silent observer to the festivities rather than a participant. The air of introspection amidst the hustle and bustle of the hotel hinted at the mysteries untold, setting the stage for a puzzle that would soon unfold around him. On his final evening, Leroy Piper was seen dining alone, a quiet observer in the dining room of the Fountain Hotel. He ate as if memorizing every detail of his surroundings. After his meal, he purchased a cigar, a simple act that marked the beginning of a profound mystery. With the cigar in his hand, Piper stepped out into the night, leaving the warmth and light of the hotel behind for the cool, starlit wilderness of Yellowstone National Park. When Piper did not return, concern quickly rippled through the hotel. Initially, there were hopes he might have taken a longer walk than originally thought, captivated by the nocturnal beauty of the park. But as hours turned into days without a sign of him, worry deepened. A search was organized, with hotel staff and volunteers combing the nearby woods and meadows, calling out his name and hoping for a response. The park's vastness made the search daunting. Detachments of cavalry were even brought in, their horses thundering through the landscape, yet no trace of Piper was found. As the search expanded, so did the concern among the hotel guests and the local community. The mysterious circumstances of Piper's disappearance became the focus of whispered conversations and speculative theories. What happened to the quiet man from Ohio after he stepped into the Yellowstone night? The search expanded quickly, with teams venturing deeper into Yellowstone's rugged wilderness. The terrain itself posed significant challenges, with dense forests, steep ravines, and unpredictable geysers and hot springs that dotted the landscape. Despite these obstacles, searchers remained determined, driven by the hope of finding any clue that might reveal Piper's whereabouts. As the search continued with no success, theories and rumors began to swirl among the hotel guests and staff. Some speculated that Piper, perhaps overwhelmed by personal thoughts, had wandered off, losing his way in the vast park. Others whispered of a more sinister fate, suggesting he might have encountered foul play or fallen victim to the wild animals that roamed the area. 
The mystery deepened with each passing day, and the lack of evidence only fueled further speculation. The park's natural beauty became a backdrop to a growing list of possible scenarios, each more puzzling than the last. Among the staff and guests, the question of Piper's fate became a topic of constant discussion, with everyone offering their own theories, but no one able to provide answers. The disappearance of the quiet man had turned into a mystery that captivated and confounded the imagination of all who heard about it. The Fountain Hotel, nestled in Yellowstone splendor, was surrounded by attractions that drew guests closer to the wild heart of the park. Notably, a bear feeding station behind the hotel offered thrilling encounters with nature as guests watched from a safe distance. The bears came to feast on scraps. Additionally, the area was renowned for its geothermal wonders, with geysers and hot springs painting a landscape both beautiful and volatile. These attractions, while marvels to behold, posed inherent hazards that cannot be overlooked, especially in light of Piper's mysterious disappearance. The bear feeding station, though a source of entertainment, highlighted the presence of wild and potentially dangerous animals in the vicinity. This proximity to wildlife sparked concerns that Piper might have had an unexpected encounter with a bear leading to his disappearance. The geothermal features, with their boiling water and unpredictable eruptions, presented a natural danger. The mesmerizing beauty of these sites could easily lure a visitor too close with perilous consequences. In the wake of Piper's vanishing, some wondered if he had ventured to admire these natural wonders, only to fall victim to their hidden dangers. As speculation grew, these attractions and their risks became a focal point in the discussion about what might have happened to Piper. The natural beauty and potential peril underscored the mysterious circumstances of his disappearance, adding layers of intrigue and concern to the unfolding story. Following Leroy R. Piper's disappearance, the Fountain Hotel's once vibrant atmosphere shifted to one of unease and whispering curiosity. The lively conversations and laughter that had filled the grand halls and dining room were now tinged with the hushed tones of speculation and concern. Guests moved with a newfound wariness, their thoughts occupied by the unsolved mystery of the man who vanished into the night. Piper's room, left exactly it was before he stepped out, became a silent testament to the mystery. The bed, untouched since that evening, and his belongings scattered as if he would return at any moment, served as a haunting reminder to all those who passed by. The hotel staff, respecting the gravity of the situation, preserved the room's state, allowing no one to enter. It stood as a sort of shrine over a frozen moment in time, embodying the unanswered questions surrounding Piper's fate. This change affected everyone at the Fountain Hotel. Guests whispered their theories and rumors among themselves, while staff members shared concerned glances, all feeling the weight of the mystery that had taken over their once peaceful retreat. The disappearance of Piper had cast a shadow over the hotel, transforming it from a place of escape and wonder to a setting of enduring mystery. The search for Piper extended beyond the immediate vicinity of the Fountain Hotel, reaching to the furthest corners of Yellowstone Park. Despite the exhaustive efforts, which included combing through dense forests, navigating the rugged terrain, and scrutinizing every potential clue, the search parties came up empty-handed. No evidence of Piper's whereabouts ever emerged, deepening the mystery and frustrating those involved. As the search expanded, so too did the theories about what might have happened to Piper. Some suggested he might have accidentally fallen into one of the many geothermal features, a tragic misstep leaving no trace behind. Others speculated about a possible criminal element, suggesting Piper could have been the victim of foul play, a theory supported by the absence of any clues or witnesses. Speculative theories also circulated, ranging from the idea that Piper, seeking solitude, had intentionally vanished into the wilderness to start anew, to other notions involving wild animals or even supernatural explanations. Each theory, while differing in details, underscored the collective need to make sense of the unexplainable disappearance. As speculation mounted, the mystery of what happened to the quiet man from Ohio continued to captivate and confound, becoming a haunting element of Yellowstone National Park's history and lore. Years after Leroy R. Piper's disappearance, the grandeur of the Fountain Hotel eventually faded into history. 
By 1916, the once bustling hotel had closed its doors, and in 1927, it was demolished, leaving behind only memories and stories. Among these tales, Piper's vanishing act remained one of the most captivating, a mystery that has lingered in the shadows of Yellowstone's past, untouched by time. Leroy R. Piper's story has left an indelible mark on Yellowstone's history and the experiences of those who visit. It has become a testament to the park's capacity to awe and also to mystify, offering a narrative that compels as much as it warns. Visitors are drawn not only to Yellowstone's natural wonder, but also to the stories and mysteries embedded in its landscape, with Piper's tale being among the most compelling. Reflecting on the nature of unsolved mysteries, Piper's disappearance underscores their profound impact on our collective imagination. These stories, particularly ones as enduring as Piper's, resonates through time, offering endless possibilities and inviting speculation. They remind us the limits of our understanding and the allure of the unknown. In the vastness of places like Yellowstone, mysteries such as Leroy Piper's not only endure, they become a part of the fabric, intriguing new generations and keeping the spirit of exploration and wonder alive. Sandra Hughes, a 54-year-old woman, decided to make a significant change in her life. Up until then, her life hadn't gone as she had hoped. After two divorces and a career in accounting, despite her passion for the outdoors and wilderness survival, Sandra found herself longing for more. She had spent most of her adult life moving around, never really settling down or finding a place she could call home. In June of 2020, amid the quiet pause of the world due to quarantine restrictions, Sandra saw an opportunity to reconnect with her love for nature. She sold her place in Maui, Hawaii, and moved to Madeira County, California, located between Yosemite National Park and the Sierra National Forest. Sandra planned an extended solo camping trip into the Sierra National Forest, aiming to find happiness and fulfillment while adhering to quarantine guidelines. This decision marked the beginning of a mystery that would captivate many. Sandra Hughes found herself at a crossroads in life, leading up to her mysterious disappearance. Her history was marked by a nomadic existence, characterized by a series of moves from one place to another across the vast landscapes of the United States. This constant motion reflected a search for something more, a pursuit that seemed to elude her in her settled life. Professionally, Sandra had built a career in accounting, a field that demanded precision and analytical skills. However, beneath the surface of numbers and financial statements, there was another side to her, a profound connection to the wilderness. Sandra was not only an accountant, she was also a skilled survivalist. Her college years had been spent not just poring over textbooks on accounting, but also engaging deeply with wilderness survival courses. This education wasn't just academic. It was a passion deeply ingrained in her being. Sandra's personal life, however, bore the marks of its own trials and tribulations. She had entered into two marriages, hoping perhaps to build a life together with someone who shared her dreams and aspirations. Unfortunately, both marriages ended in divorce, leaving her to navigate the complexities of life's journeys alone. Moreover, the absence of children in her life added another layer of solitude to her existence. Yet, despite these personal setbacks, Sandra's spirit remained unbroken. Her passion for the outdoors, an unwavering love for the raw beauty and untamed wilderness, continued to be a source of joy and solace. This combination of her professional expertise, her survival skills, and her deep-seated love for nature painted a picture of a woman who, despite the unpredictabilities and the disappointments that life had thrown her way, was determined to carve out moments of fulfillment and happiness. It was this indomitable spirit that led her to make the significant decision to embark on a solo camping trip into the Sierra National Forest, a decision that marked the beginning of a mysterious chapter in her life. Sandra Hughes's journey into the unknown began in June of 2020 when she made a bold move to embrace nature in a way she hadn't before. She had just settled into her new life in Madeira County, California, a place chosen for its close proximity to the breathtaking landscapes of Yosemite National Park and the Sierra National Forest. 
inspired by the world slowing down due to quarantine, Sandra saw a perfect chance to reconnect with her outdoor roots. Her last communication with her family was filled with excitement and a hint of adventure. Sandra shared her plans for an extended solo camping trip into the Sierra National Forest. She was drawn to the beauty and solitude of Johnson Meadows, a spot known for its stunning green expanses framed by thick forests and towering snow-capped mountains. This would be her retreat, a place to find peace and solace in the wilderness that she so dearly loved. The decision to venture into the National Forest alone was met with support from her family, who understood Sandra's need to be one with nature. Despite the inherent risks of solo camping, Sandra's skills in wilderness survival reassured her loved ones that she was well prepared for the journey ahead. Little did they know this would be the last time they would hear from her, as Sandra set off into the forest, eagerly anticipating the tranquility and fulfillment that awaited her in Johnson Meadows. On July 2nd, a group of hikers stumbled upon a campsite that caught their attention for all the wrong reasons. It was Sandra Hughes' campsite, but it didn't look like any ordinary site left by a camper temporarily away. Instead, it was abandoned and in complete disarray, as if a storm had passed through, scattering gear and personal items everywhere. The tent was torn apart, and the belongings were strewn about, indicating a sudden and chaotic departure. The hikers, concerned by the state of the campsite and the possibility that its occupant might be in danger, decided to take action. They meticulously marked the location on their map, ensuring they could direct others back to this exact spot. Once they had cell service, they immediately contacted the Madeira County Sheriff's Office to report what they had found. The Sheriff's Office dispatched officers to Johnson Meadows to investigate the campsite. Upon arrival, they confirmed the hikers' findings. The site was indeed abandoned, and the destruction suggested a distressing event had occurred. Among the scattered items, they found identification belonging to Sandra Hughes, confirming her as the campsite's occupant and raising urgent concerns for her safety and whereabouts. An extensive search operation was launched to find her. Law enforcement, alongside a group of volunteers, combed through the vast expanse of the Sierra National Forest. They covered ground on foot, utilized sniffer dogs, and even deployed helicopters to broaden the search area. Despite their efforts, Sandra remained elusive, with no clear signs pointing to her whereabouts. However, during this tense time, there were reported sightings of Sandra that added layers of mystery to her disappearance. Witnesses described seeing a woman matching Sandra's description, distinctive because of her blue hair, appearing out of place and disoriented in the wilderness. In one sighting, she was described as barefoot, wearing a black shirt and blue jeans, with a noticeable bruise on her face. This description matched Sandra's last known appearance, yet her behavior seemed unusual. She did not signal for help or indicate that she was in distress, leaving witnesses confused and concerned. Adding to the complexity of the search was the discovery of Sandra's vehicle in a ravine several miles from where her campsite had been found. The car appeared to have crashed, rolling down an embankment off a winding forest road. There was no blood found inside the vehicle, which left questions about whether Sandra had been injured in the accident. Like her campsite, personal items were scattered all around the vehicle, suggesting someone had rummaged through it after the crash. This discovery deepened the mystery, raising more questions about the events leading up to and following Sandra's disappearance. The unexpected discovery of Sandra's sleeping bag near the remote spotted lake in Yosemite National Park added another layer to her already mysterious disappearance. Found a considerable distance from both her destroyed campsite and where her vehicle had met its unfortunate end in a ravine, the sleeping bag's location was a crucial clue that seemed to defy simple explanation. Positioned in a part of the park known for its rugged beauty and challenging terrain, the sleeping bag appeared as though it had been used recently, suggesting that Sandra had made it at least this far in her unexplained journey. This sequence of discoveries, starting from her initial campsite in the Sierra National Forest, to her car in the ravine, and now the sleeping bag near Spotted Lake, drew a puzzling line across the map. 
Each point seemed to suggest a deliberate, albeit perplexing, northward trajectory through some of the most unforgiving wilderness areas in California. The questions this path raised were intriguing. Was Sandra intentionally moving north? And if so, why? How would she manage to traverse such difficult landscapes, seemingly without the bulk of her gear, and, as some sightings suggested, in a barefoot and disheveled state? Moreover, this linear path of locations connected with Sandra's disappearance did little to clarify her motivations or the circumstances that led her deeper into the wilderness. Instead, it only deepened the mystery, weaving a complex series of events that search teams and investigators struggled to unravel. The search efforts, initially focused on finding Sandra, now also had to connect with understanding the rationale behind her movements. Was she seeking something or someone, fleeing from a perceived threat, or simply disoriented and lost? In a twist that reignited interest in Sandra Hughes' puzzling disappearance, two hunters reported a strange encounter that seemed to be directly linked to her case. While driving down a secluded forest road, they noticed a woman who bore a striking resemblance to Sandra. She was positioned away from the road, leaning against a tree in a manner that seemed both deliberate and out of place. The hunters described the woman as having no camping gear or any obvious means of support in the dense forest, a detail that immediately raised questions about her well-being and how she had come to be in such a remote location. The woman's appearance matched descriptions of Sandra. She was wearing overalls and a floral t-shirt, a change from the last reported sighting, but still consistent with her being without her original gear. The sighting added to the growing list of odd occurrences surrounding her disappearance. The woman's presence in the forest, without any belongings, suggested a pattern of erratic behavior or circumstances beyond her control. The hunters attempted to communicate with the woman, hoping to offer her help or at least confirm her identity, but she did not respond to their calls. This lack of interaction, coupled with her unusual location and state of being, mirrored the chaotic and unexplained scenes left behind at Sandra's last known sites. Despite the hunters' attempts to unravel the situation, the woman's identity and circumstances remained unclear, further complicating this already mystifying case. In another chilling development, the Gorba family shared a haunting experience that added a perplexing layer to the mystery of Sandra Hughes. While on a drive in the Sierra National Forest, their three-year-old son, Caden, began speaking to someone invisible to everyone else. Caden insisted there was a woman outside, needing help. This claim startled his parents, especially when he described the woman as lying face down with her legs up in the air, suggesting a dire situation. Caden's description of the woman was eerily specific. She wore a black shirt, blue jeans, and had blue hair. This matched the previous descriptions of Sandra Hughes, capturing the attention of both the family and later of law enforcement. The detail about the blue hair in particular was a significant clue linking the child's claim directly to Sandra. The Gorba family, deeply unsettled by Caden's assertions, promptly left the area. They later shared their story, which quickly caught the attention of the authorities. Law enforcement took Caden's claim seriously, especially given the specificity of his description and its alignment with Sandra's last known appearance. This led to a renewed interest in the area described by Caden, as officials and the family grappled with the eerie possibility that the young boy might have seen Sandra, or at least an apparition of her, when no one else could. The disappearance of Sandra Hughes remains an unsolved puzzle, weaving together a series of strange events and sightings into a mystery that has yet to be unraveled. Despite extensive search efforts and the peculiar details brought forth by witnesses and even the child, Sandra's fate and whereabouts remain unknown. Her journey, which began as a quest for solitude and connection with nature, has turned into a haunting tale of disappearance and intrigue. We encourage anyone with information, no matter how small or seemingly insignificant, to come forward and contact the Madeira County Sheriff's Office. Your piece of the puzzle could be the key to uncovering the truth about what happened to Sandra Hughes. This story is a reminder of the profound mysteries that lie in the heart of the wilderness, challenging our understanding and often leaving more questions than answers. 
The search for Sandra continues, not just as a quest for one woman, but as a pursuit of truth in the face of the unknown. As we reflect on her story, we are reminded of the complexity and unpredictability of life and the enduring nature of mysteries that compel us to keep searching, keep questioning, and never give up hope. David Milton Crouch, a 27-year-old from Stevensville, Maryland, was not just any cycling enthusiast. Alongside his wife, he transformed his passion for bicycles into a thriving business, owning a local bike shop where both dreams and two-wheeled adventures were daily realities. Their lives, intertwined with the joy of cycling, epitomized a dream come true for many. David's life, deeply rooted in the love for the open road and the freedom it offered, was a testament to pursuing one's passion with vigor and dedication. However, the serene and fulfilling life David led took an unexpected turn on August 31st of 1997. On that breezy autumn day, David set out from his home, unknowingly for the last time, embarking on a hiking and fishing expedition far from the familiar landscapes of Maryland. The destination was the Bridger Tenton National Forest in western Wyoming, a vast wilderness spanning over 2,000 miles from his doorstep. This was a place of rugged beauty and untamed nature, far removed from the cycling trails and community he knew so well. David, along with three friends and a guide, ventured into the heart of this wilderness, seeking adventure amidst its towering peaks and serene lakes. Yet, what was meant to be a journey of exploration and camaraderie swiftly veiled into a mystery that has perplexed many to this day. As the group navigated the sprawling expanse of the forest, David became separated from his companions. Intent on a solo fishing trip to Island Lake, a picturesque spot nestled within the forest's embrace, he departed from the group, stepping into the unknown. The circumstances of David's disappearance remain shrouded in mystery, casting a shadow over the forest's natural splendor. Despite the passing of time, the questions linger, echoing among the trees and across the lakes of the National Forest. What unfolded on that fateful day as David pursued a moment of solitude by Island Lake? At 27, David Milton Crouch was in the prime of his life, his essence interwoven within the spirit of cycling. His passion wasn't just a hobby, it was the very best of his heart, a rhythm that guided his life's journey. Together with his wife, David channeled this unwavering love for cycling into a venture that was more than just a business. It was a shared dream in motion. In their bike shop nestled in Stevensville, Maryland, they didn't just sell bicycles. They were architects of adventure, curators of freedom on two wheels. Their life was a harmonious blend of personal passion and professional ambition, a rare feat where work and play danced together seamlessly. David's expertise and enthusiasm for cycling transformed their bike shop into a local hub, a place where fellow cycling enthusiasts could not only find their perfect ride, but also a community. Together, David and his wife cultivated a space that thrived on the joy of cycling, making their dream a reality for themselves and their customers. This idyllic existence, however, was marked by a profound love for the outdoors, a trait that extended beyond the confines of cycling paths and into the heart of nature itself. It was a love that eventually led David to the vast, open space of the Bridger Tenton National Forest. Yet, as he ventured into this new wilderness, little did anyone know that it would become the backdrop to a mystery that would leave a lingering question mark in the serene environment of the National Forest. On the last day of August in 1997, David and his companions, guided by the spirit of adventure, embarked on a journey into the National Forest. This vast expanse of wilderness, contrasting with the familiar terrains of Maryland, promised an escape into nature's untouched beauty. The group, although overwhelmed with excitement, was treading on unfamiliar ground, a fact that underscored their adventure with the element of the unknown. As the day unfolded, David, ever the enthusiast for new experiences, felt a pull towards Island Lake, a serene spot known for its fishing potential. Armed with nothing but his fishing rod, he decided to split from the group for a solo expedition. It was a decision made in the moment, driven by the allure of solitude and the tranquil beauty of the lake. However, David's spontaneous venture was marked by a critical oversight, 
He had left behind his survival gear, venturing into the wilderness, unprepared for what lay ahead. The hours passed, and as the sun began to set, a sense of unease settled over the group. David had not returned. What started as a day filled with anticipation and joy slowly morphed into a situation fraught with concern. The realization that David was missing catalyzed his friends into action. They retraced their steps, scouring the paths they had taken in hopes of finding any sign of their missing friend. The forest, vast and indifferent, offered no clues, only deepening the mystery of David's whereabouts. By the following morning, with David still missing and the night's cold having claimed the forest, the gravity of the situation was undeniable. The Sublette County Sheriff's Office was alerted, and what ensued was a search operation that saw the mobilization of local search and rescue teams. The forest, once a backdrop for adventure, became the focus of a determined search effort. Teams combed through the wilderness, driven by the hope of finding David safe. Yet, as days turned into nights and back into days, the forest remained silent, keeping the secret of David's disappearance within its vast embrace. The search extensive in its scope, brought together a community united in concern, but was met with the harsh reality of nature's profound and puzzling silence. In the wake of David's disappearance, the National Forest became the epicenter of an exhaustive search operation. The mission to find David saw the deployment of resources on a scale seldom seen. Helicopters beat the air above, their blades slicing through the silence of the forest, while search teams on foot navigated the treacherous underbrush below. Dogs, trained to seek out human scents, were let loose, with their keen noses hopeful of picking up a trail left by David. The community, both local and beyond, watched and waited, their collective breath held in anticipation of any new news. The challenges facing the search teams were formidable. The terrain of the Bridger Tenton National Forest is as beautiful as it is unforgiving. Vast swaths of lands with rugged peaks and deep valleys, making the task of searching not just difficult, but also perilous. The weather, an ever-present force in the wilderness, turned against the efforts of the rescuers. Bad weather rolled in, reducing visibility, hampering the helicopters, and adding a pressing urgency to the search. David, who had ventured out with nothing more than his fishing rod, was ill-equipped to face the elements, a fact that cast a shadow of grim reality over the hopes of finding him safe. As days turned into weeks, the intensity of the search efforts began to wane. Resources, both physical and emotional, were stretched thin. The local authorities, who had led the search with the determination fueled by hope, began to acknowledge the dawning reality of the situation. Statements were made, grim in their acceptance of likelihood that David had not survived this ordeal. The decision to scale back the search was met with heavy hearts, a testament to the harsh truth that sometimes, despite the best efforts of many, nature keeps its secrets closely guarded. David Milton Crouch's disappearance left a void in the heart of Stevensville, Maryland, a community that had known him not just as a business owner, but as a friend neighbor, and an integral part of their community and daily lives. The news of his vanishing in the remote wilderness of Wyoming sent ripples of shock and sorrow through the town, uniting its residents in a shared sense of loss and concern. In the wake of the tragedy, the Crouch family found themselves surrounded by the warmth and support of their community. Despite their overwhelming grief, they took comfort in the outpouring of love and solidarity. The Crouch family is one of the well-known families on the island, remark Reverend Ken Valentine, pastor of Kent Island United Methodist Church, where David was a member. We've had prayers for David all last week. It's very sad, he added, voicing the collective heartache that gripped the community. The family's response to the tragedy was one of quiet dignity, choosing to grieve privately. They nonetheless expressed their gratitude for the ceaseless support, the prayers, and the hope that continued to come from their neighbors and friends. It has to be a terrible feeling to have someone missing and not knowing if he is dead or alive. My heart goes out to the family, shared Dolores Timms, a neighbor, encapsulating empathy and concern in her statement. Amidst the sorrow, the community spirit remained unbroken. Vigils were held and David's story was shared far and wide, keeping the flame of hope alive for any news of his whereabouts. The collective effort to support the Crouch family underscored a fundamental truth about Stevensville. 
In times of despair, the community stood as one, offering a beacon of light in the darkest of times. David's disappearance became more than a personal tragedy for his family. It was a moment that united the community, a reminder of the bonds that hold us together in the face of uncertainty and sorrow. As the years have passed, the mysterious disappearance of David Milton Crouch on August 31st of 1997 in the vast expanse of the Bridger Tent National Forest remains an unsolved chapter in the lives of those who knew him and the community at large. David was described as a white male with brown hair, standing 5 foot 10 inches tall and weighing approximately 175 pounds. He was last seen wearing jeans and a flannel shirt. These details, frozen in time, serve as a reminder of a person who stepped into the wilderness that day, never to return. The Sublette County Sheriff's Office continues to seek any information regarding David's disappearance, urging anyone who might know something, no matter how insignificant it may seem, to come forward. This event serves as a reflection on the unpredictable nature of wilderness exploration and the critical importance of preparation and safety measures. David's story underscores the need for adventure to equip themselves, not only with the necessary gear, but also with the knowledge and skills to navigate the challenges posed by the natural world. In memory of David and in honor of the ongoing efforts to find him, we call upon listeners to share any information they may have related to his disappearance. Furthermore, this story reminds us of the strength found in community support during times of tragedy. Let's stand together, offering hope and assistance to those affected by loss, and continue to foster a culture of safety and preparedness for all who seek to explore the beauty and majesty of our natural surroundings. In the vast and wild heart of Oregon, nestled among the towering mountains and dense forests, lies Sparks Lake, a serene yet haunting backdrop for one of the most mystifying disappearances in Oregon State's history. It was here, in the autumn of 1969, that Robert Winters, a 78-year-old avid hunter, vanished without a trace. Robert, accompanied by his sons, had ventured into this well-known hunting ground, a place they had returned to year after year, drawn by the promise of solitude and the thrill of the hunt. This particular trip, however, would tell a narrative far removed from their annual expeditions. As the leaves turned and the chill of fall began to settle over the landscape, Robert set out with his rifle and his knowledge of the wild, embarking on what was supposed to be a day like any other in the great Oregon outdoors. But as the hours ticked by and night began to fall, it became clear that something had gone profoundly wrong. Robert did not return to camp, igniting the onset of a search that would span seasons and capture the attention of locals and beyond. The mystique of Sparks Lake, with its panoramic views and rugged terrain, transformed from a scenic hunting locale to the center of an enduring puzzle. Situated between the imposing silhouettes of Broken Top Mountain and Mount Bachelor, the area's natural beauty belies the harsh and unpredictable nature of the wilderness. It's a place where elements converge, landscapes clash, and beauty mingles with danger, setting a dramatic stage for Robert's inexplicable disappearance. The incident opens a gateway into a mystery that remains unsolved, weaving a tale of man versus nature, of sudden silence amidst the whispers of the wild. The story of Robert Winters is not just a recounting of a man lost. It's a narrative steeped in the mysterious allure of the natural world, a reminder of its untamed and unscrutable character. The Winters family tradition was not just a series of annual hunting trips. It was a legacy a ritual that bound Robert and his sons, Charles, George, and Alvin, together with the threads of anticipation and shared adventure. For over two decades, these expeditions had been a constant, a time for reconnecting with both nature and each other in the rugged heartland of Oregon. The familiarity of Robert and his sons with the area around Sparks Lake was profound. The trails, the best spots for camping, and where the game was likely to roam were all knowledge passed down and honed over years of experience. This deep understanding of the landscape makes Robert's disappearance all the more baffling. How could a man so in tune with the wilderness, so aware of its dangers, simply vanish without a trace? The very familiarity that should have safeguarded Robert seemed to betray him, as the wilderness he knew so well cloaked its secrets tightly, leaving no trace of his fate. 
the landscape of Sparks Lake, beloved and well-trodden by the Winters family, transformed from a setting of yearly reunions into the backdrop of an unfathomable mystery. On the crisp morning of October 8, 1969, the Winters family camp was alive with the routine bustle of preparation. It was a day like many others they had seen before, a moment suspended in the chill of autumn, teetering on the cusp of another hunting adventure. Robert, with the ease of someone embarking on a familiar journey, set off from the camp, rifle in hand, a casual farewell hanging in the air. It was a normal departure, set among the sprawling beauty of Oregon's wilderness. The sky overhead was a vast expanse of clarity, but the air carried a whisper of change, hinting at the weather's fickle nature. As the day unfolded, the sun traced its arc across the sky, unmarred by the clouds that would later gather. Robert's absence, as first noted without concern, grew heavy with significance in the hours that waned. The routine expectation of his return by dusk morphed into a growing unease. The light faded, painting a shadow deeper into the forest, and Robert did not emerge from the embrace of the wilderness. The family's initial concerns were amplified as darkness fell upon the camp, and a silence, thick with worry, settled over them. Nature seemed to respond in kind as the first signs of heavy snowfall began to accumulate, whispering through the trees and blanketing the ground in a swift, cold shroud. This unexpected weather transformation added a layer of urgency to their worry. The benign environment they had welcomed in the morning had turned treacherous, complicating any efforts to search for Robert. The night passed with no sign of him, the family's anxiety mounting against the backdrop of an increasingly impenetrable wilderness. The serene setting of their annual hunting trips had, within mere hours, spiraled into the stage of a perplexing mystery, a loved one lost to the forest with nature cloaking his steps in snow and silence. As concern for Robert Winters turned into tangible fear under the cloak of night, his family wasted no time in reaching out for help. The authorities were notified, ushering in the commencement of a search and rescue operation that would soon swell in scale and intensity. The family's call for assistance echoed across the community, rallying a collective effort to uncover Robert's whereabouts. Yet, as volunteers and officials mobilized, the weather emerged as an unforeseen adversary. The snow, which had begun as a whisper in the darkness, grew into a relentless storm, laying down a thick blanket that obscured tracks and transformed the landscape into a monochrome maze. The worsening conditions threatened visibility and accessibility, presenting a daunting obstacle to the rescuers' endeavors. In response to the urgency of the situation, the search efforts expanded rapidly. A diverse assembly of search parties took to the ground, each step forward a defiance against the snow's silence. Tracking dogs, with their keen senses, were enlisted in the hope that they might succeed where human eyes had failed. Helicopters were also called into service as they buzzed overhead, their pilots peering down through the wintry veil in search of any sign of Robert. It was from one of these aerial vantage points that a glimmer of hope emerged, tracks spotted near Soda Creek, a silent testament to Robert's passage. However, this discovery was far from a resolution. The tracks, though a tangible clue, led the searchers through a challenging terrain that had tested both their resolve and their resources. The area around Soda Creek, rugged and untamed, became the focal point of an intensified search. Yet, as the rescuers navigated the harsh landscape, the mystery only deepened. The tracks, a fragile thread in the vast tapestry of the wilderness, eventually faded, leaving no further sign of Robert's fate. Despite the dedication of those involved, their efforts of the search was met with more questions than answers. The mystery of Robert's disappearance, compounded by the very nature that he had so loved. Robert Winter's disappearance took a turn toward the profound when, in the warmth of the following summer, a hiker stumbled upon a clue that had eluded the searchers through the cold months. Dr. Jack Crosby, exploring near Soda Creek just beneath the line where the trees give way to the sky, found objects silently resting on the ground. These were no ordinary items. They belonged to Robert, the man who had vanished into the whispering wilderness. Among the discoveries were Robert's hunting gear, glasses, and a piece of clothing, each item a silent sentinel of his last known moments. 
Strikingly, amidst the belongings that spoke of a life once lived, there was a palpable absence. Robert himself remained missing, with no trace of his physical presence to be found. The sheriff's department promptly responded, conducting a thorough examination of the site where Dr. Crosby made his find. What they encountered only deepened the mystery. The condition of the clothing, laid out as if to mark the end of a journey never completed, was perplexing. There was no disarray, no signs of a violent struggle or attack from an animal. Instead, the garments appeared to have been removed with deliberation, placed beside Robert's rifle, which leaned against a tree as if standing guard. Deputies Mel Newhouse and Norman Thrasher, tasked with investigating this curious scene, found themselves confounded by the evidence before them. The lack of any remains, coupled with the orderly condition of Robert's belongings, painted a picture that defied simple explanation. It was as if the wilderness itself had chosen to keep its secrets, swallowing any trace of Robert Winters, but leaving behind these few silent witnesses. The discovery of the belongings raised more questions than answers, leaving the sheriff's department and the Winters family grappling with the undiminished mystery of Robert's fate. In the wake of Robert Winters' disappearance, a number of theories and speculations began to weave itself through the community and beyond. People pondered over dinner tables and in quiet corners of coffee shops, each theory attempting to pierce the veil of the mystery that the wilderness had drawn around Robert's fate. Some poised that Robert had succumbed to the harsh environmental conditions, perhaps losing his way in the sudden snowstorm that had blanketed the area. Others whispered of wildlife encounters, imagining a silent predator that might have crossed paths with him. Yet for all the speculation, Robert's deep familiarity with the terrain stood as a stark counterpoint to these theories of a simple misstep or a loss of direction. This was a man who had walked these woods for over two decades, who knew the land as one knows the lines of their own hand. Such experience cast a long shadow of doubt over the simpler explanations, suggesting that whatever happened to Robert was far from ordinary. The continued mystery, underscored by the absence of any conclusive evidence or remains, left a lasting imprint on the family and the community. The discovery of Robert's belongings had offered a brief flicker of hope, a potential path to closure that quickly extinguished as the search revealed no more. The questions that lingered in the wake of the search party's departure were not just about how or why Robert disappeared. They touched on the very nature of the wilderness itself, on the secrets it keeps, and on the thin veil that separates the known from the unknowable. For the Winner's family, the unresolved case was a wound that time struggled to heal. For the community, it was a haunting reminder of the wilderness's indomitable will, a story to be told in hushed tones as a testament to the mysteries that lay in the heart of the forest. Theories and speculations continue to swirl, each as elusive as the last, leaving the mystery of Robert Winter's disappearance to linger in the air like the mist that rolls off Spark Lake at dawn. The disappearance of Robert Winters left a lasting impact on his family and on the hunting community, embodying the unpredictable nature of the wilderness. Marked as one of Central Oregon's most extensive search operations, the case remains part of the local lore, unresolved and haunting. Despite the passage of time, the mystery continues to capture the imagination of locals and enthusiasts alike, fueling ongoing speculation and discussion. Robert's story serves as a reminder of the wild depths and the enduring human quest for answers in the face of nature's puzzles. In the autumn of 1981, the Great Smoky Mountains wore a majestic cloak of reds, oranges, and yellows, painting a breathtaking canvas that attracts nature lovers from far and wide. Nestled in the heart of this natural splendor lies the Deep Creek Campground, a haven for those seeking the serene embrace of nature and the simple joys of outdoor life. It is here, amidst the whispering trees and meandering trails, that Thelma, Pauline, Melton, or Polly, and her husband, Bob Melton, find their seasonal retreat, escaping the hustle of the everyday to bask in the tranquil beauty of the fall months. Polly, rarely known by her given name, Thelma, carries life stories woven with threads of joy, hardship, and adventure. Married to Bob, a man 20 years her senior, their union marks Polly's third attempt at matrimonial bliss. Yet, 
It is with Bob that Polly seems to have found a true partner, with whom she shared not just her love, but a jest for the nomadic lifestyle that sees them living out of an Airstream trailer. This portable home on wheels symbolizes more than just a means of travel. It represents freedom, a shared dream, and a life unbound by the conventional. Standing here, amidst fall colors in the Great Smoky Mountains, I feel an overwhelming sense of peace. Deep Creek Campground isn't just a retreat, it's become a part of who I am. Our life together, unconventional as it may be, living out of our Airstream trailer, represents freedom, a shared dream, a testament to a life unbound by the usual paths. Every day is a new adventure, and as I look out at the mountains, I'm grateful for the journey that brought me here. With Bob by my side, I've found a completeness I didn't know I was searching for. This life, our life, is unconventional, but it's ours, and I wouldn't have it any other way. This is my home. Their bond, strengthened by the shared silence and laughter within the compact walls of their airstream, grows deeper with each passing year. Bob, now 78, finds his world increasingly confined to the interior of their mobile home. His health, a declining slope that contrasts sharply with the vibrant landscape outside. Polly, 58, vibrant and full of life, finds solace and strength in the great outdoors, her passion for hiking undimmed by the passing years or her own battles with health issues. Each fall, as the mountains call, Polly and Bob make their trip to the Deep Creek Campground. It's a ritual, an annual journey that Polly treasures above all else. For two decades, this tradition has anchored her, a constant in her life marked by change. The campground, with its community of fellow retirees and nature enthusiasts, becomes a second home, a place where Polly is not just known but cherished. Here, friendships are forged in campfires and conversations under the vast canopy of the stars. The dynamics within this close-knit community are unique. Newcomers are embraced only through a collective nod of approval, a testament to the tight bonds formed in this secluded paradise. Polly, with her easy smile and helping hand, is a linchpin in this community, her presence as familiar as the perennial trees surrounding them. With Bob by her side, albeit more in spirit than on hikes, Polly navigates the trails and the complexities of campground relationships with equal ease, her life rich with the threads of nature, love, and communal living. Arriving at Deep Creek Campground in the heart of the Great Smoky Mountains fall splendor, I was immediately struck by the vibrant colors and the sense of community that seemed to permeate the air. I had heard about the close-knit group of retirees and nature lovers who called this place a second home, and I was eager to find my own place among them. It wasn't long before I learned of Polly and Bob Melton, pillars of this community. Polly, with her infectious smile and generous spirit, quickly became a figure of intrigue and admiration for me. She navigated the campground and its relationships with a grace that made her beloved by all. Bob, though less physically present on the trails, was equally a part of the community's heart, his bond with Polly, a testament to enduring partnership. As the days passed, I found myself becoming more intertwined with the life here. The welcoming nature of the community, so deeply influenced by Polly's warmth and Bob's quiet strength, offered a sense of belonging I hadn't known I was seeking. Around campfires and under the canopy of stars, I began to weave my own threads into the fabric of this community, discovering a life enriched by nature, companionship, and shared stories. Here, in the embrace of the mountains and the company of newfound friends, I found a home. As 1981 unfolds, the serene beauty of the Smoky Mountains and the predictable rhythm of campground life mask the undercurrents of mystery that swirl quietly beneath the surface. Little does anyone know, this year will etch the name Thelma, Pauline, Polly, Melton into the fabric of unsolved mysteries. Her story, a whisper among the rustling leaves, a shadow in the misty expanse of the mountain that she so dearly loves. On the morning of September 25, 1981, the dense canopy of the Great Smoky Mountains seemed to hold its breath, a prelude to the day that would etch itself into the memory of the Deep Creek Campground. Polly made an uncharacteristic choice that morning. For years, her routine had been as predictable as the sunrise 
including her commitment to serving food to local senior citizens, a task that she approached with a blend of duty and delight. Yet, on this day, Polly opted out, setting aside her volunteer apron for reasons that would remain a whisper among the trees. This decision was the first thread of abnormality in what was to unfold as a mystery. Polly instead turned her focus to the mountains that called to her spirit. As she readied herself, her actions seemed no different from any other day destined for the trails, except for the palpable absence of her usual morning destination. Joined by her friends Red and Truella, the trio set off into the heart of the Smoky Mountains. The air was crisp, the path ahead was a familiar friend to Polly, who had traversed these trails countless times before. Laughter and light-hearting teasing flowed easily among them, a testament to the depths of their friendship and the joy they found in each other's company. Polly, usually keeping pace with Red and Truella, inexplicably began to accelerate, her strides growing longer, her pace quickening, until she was a solitary figure on the move ahead. At first I thought it was all in jest, a playful challenge perhaps, but the widening gap between us felt out of character. Polly, wait up. I called, half laughing, half concerned, yet she didn't slow down. My laughter faded into the crisp mountain air, replaced by a growing unease. What prompted this sudden burst of speed? Was Polly simply lost in thought, or was there something more pressing on her mind? As she disappeared from view, a knot formed in my stomach. This wasn't like our Polly, the friend who thrived on our camaraderie, who always made sure we were together, especially in the unpredictable wilderness of the Smokies. I exchanged a look with Truella, both of us masked in confusion and concern. We quickened our pace, hoping to catch up, to return to the comfortable rhythm of our friendship that seemed, in that moment, as distant as Polly herself. The playful banter that had been a constant companion on their hikes fell silent as Polly's form became smaller, eventually disappearing over a crest in the trail. It was a moment suspended in time, when the ordinary act of hiking morphed into the opening scene of a mystery that would haunt the campground. When Red and Truella reached the point where Polly had vanished from their view, they found not their friend, but the empty path, an eerie quiet setting over the forest. Panic, a foreign intruder on their routine hikes, crept into the hearts of Red and Truella. Confusion painted their features as they called out for Polly, their voices swallowed by the vastness of the mountains. The initial search, fueled by a growing sense of urgency, yielded no sign of their friend. The decision to involve the park rangers marked the escalation of the situation from a simple misunderstanding to a full-scale search and rescue operation. The tranquility of Deep Creek Campground was shattered, replaced by the frantic energy of the search teams and the whispered fears of a community suddenly thrust into the unknown. The moment we realized Polly was missing, a cold wave of panic washed over me. Our calls for her, desperate and hopeful, were just absorbed by the vastness of the mountains, leaving us in a suffocating silence. What started as a routine hike spiraled into confusion and fear as Polly remained nowhere to be found. We had to get the park rangers involved, marking a grim turn from a mere worry to a serious search operation. The peaceful atmosphere of Deep Creek Campground was shattered, now pulsing with the urgent movements of search teams and the anxious murmurs of our tight-knit community. As darkness fell upon the mountains, the reality of the situation sank in. The Smokies, a place of joy and refuge for Polly, had become the backdrop for our worst fears. Dawn brought no relief, only the intensification of the search as volunteers joined, transforming the landscape into a frenzy of activity. I was struck by the community's outpouring of support, yet beneath the action a deep unease gnawed at me. The mountains, our sanctuary, now held a mystery that seemed as vast and impenetrable as the forests themselves. With each unanswered call, with every unturned leaf, the weight of Polly's absence grew heavier turning what should have been an ordinary day into anything but. Despite the collective resolve fueling the search, each effort seemed to dissolve into the mountain air, leaving behind a trail of frustration and unanswered questions. The distinctive pattern of Polly's shoe prints, a potential breadcrumb in the vast wilderness, offered a glimmer of hope, a tangible connection to the woman who had vanished. Search dogs, with their keen senses, were unleashed into the forest, 
their noses skimming the ground, seeking any scent of Polly. Yet, even their remarkable abilities seemed to falter against the mystery, leading only to dead ends and deepening the sense of perplexity surrounding her disappearance. The campground and the broader community of Bryson City, bound by the shared rhythm of seasonal migrants and the camaraderie of the great outdoors, found themselves united in shock and disbelief. The tight-knit fabric of this community, where newcomers were embraced only through collective agreement, now faced the unthinkable. Conversations around campfires turned somber. The laughter and stories of yesteryears overshadowed by the pervasive question, what happened to Polly? This collective bewilderment and concern underscored the deep connections formed, where Polly was not just a familiar face, but a cherished member of an extended family. As days turned into weeks without any sign of Polly, the void left by her absence became a breeding ground for theories and speculation. Some theorized the possibility of an abduction, despite the lack of any struggle or witnesses. Theories ventured into the wilderness itself, pondering if an animal attack could be responsible, though the absence of any evidence lent little credence to this idea. Others contemplated a more deliberate disappearance, suggesting that Polly, perhaps overwhelmed by secret troubles or a longing for a new beginning, had orchestrated her own vanishing act. Since the call came in about Polly's disappearance from Deep Creek Campground, the case has weighed heavily on me. Bryson City, usually alive with the camaraderie of outdoor enthusiasts, now feels subdued, cloaked in a silence that's hard to shake. Campfire gatherings, once full of laughter and stories, now revolve around a single question. What happened to Polly? In my time as sheriff, I've seen my share of cases, but none have echoed through the community like this. The absence of evidence for theories like abduction or an animal attack only fuels more speculation. Some whisper about the possibility of Polly orchestrating her own disappearance, driven by unseen pressures or desires for a new start. With no sign of her, these theories and the collective sense of loss only deepen. Polly was more than a missing person. She was a beloved part of our community fabric. The mystery of her disappearance, set against the backdrop of the Smokies, is a puzzle that's proving difficult to solve. My role demands objectivity and focus on the facts, yet I can't help but feel entwined in the community's search for answers and closure. This isn't just another case. It's a quest to restore peace to a community that's lost one of its own. Each theory reflected the desperation and hope of a community grappling with the unknown. Whispers of otherworldly explanations even began to surface, with suggestions of supernatural forces at play in the dense, ancient forests of the Smokies. As the search expanded in scope and scale, the mystery of Polly's disappearance only deepened, casting a long shadow over the Deep Creek campground and the hearts of those who called it home. As the initial shock of Polly Melton's disappearance settled into a persistent, uneasy quiet, attention turned to the fragments of behavior and evidence she left in her wake. The day before she vanished, Polly deviated from her routine in a manner that was both subtle and striking. Her decision to make multiple phone calls from a location she seldom used for such purposes painted a picture of premeditation, or perhaps a silent cry for help. These calls, shrouded in mystery due to the lack of traceable records, became a focal point for speculation. Who was on the other end of the line? Was Polly reaching out to someone as part of a plan to start anew? Or were these conversations a lifeline, thrown in a moment of distress? Who was she calling, and why keep it a secret from us, her friends? At night, the quiet of the camp was a reminder of her absence. Those calls, were they a sign we all missed? The idea that she might have been silently struggling, or even planning to leave, was haunting. Polly was the life of our group, it's hard to imagine she had troubles she didn't share. With every day that passed without a trace of her, those phone calls became a puzzle we couldn't solve, a piece of the mystery that kept us awake at night. It's the not knowing that's the worst part, the feeling of having missed the chance to help a friend in need. Further adding to the complexity was Polly's mental state. Known to be a private person, Polly had navigated the loss of her mother with a resilience that masked the depths of her sorrow. Yet, beneath the surface, there were whispers of depression, 
a battle fought quietly and perhaps not entirely overcome. The disappearance of Bob's volume, a medication not prescribed to Polly, but within her reach, suggested a turmoil that went deeper than many realized. Was it a coincidence, or did it hint at a desperate attempt to find solace in oblivion? Six months after Polly stepped into the unknown, a new clue emerged, as baffling as it was unexpected. A check, bearing Polly's name, was cashed in Birmingham, Alabama. This city, a thread woven into the tapestry of Polly's past, suddenly became a beacon for those searching for answers. The signature on the check, a mimicry of Polly's own handwriting, suggested an involvement but fell short of conclusive proof. Was Polly alive, orchestrating her disappearance with a precision that left her loved ones grappling in the dark? Or was someone else manipulating the strands of her story, casting shadows over the truth? The cash check did not have a clear narrative and injected a new layer of complexity into the theories surrounding Polly's fate. It stood as a solitary signpost pointing towards a life that might still be lived or a ruse crafted to mislead. The implications of this financial transaction rippled through the community, reigniting the embers of hope and suspicion in equal measure. In the search for Polly Melton, every clue seemed to deepen the mystery rather than illuminate the path to understanding. The unusual behaviors, the untraceable phone calls, and the volume that vanished all converged around the cash check, leaving those who sought the truth pondering the mysterious twists of fate that could hide a woman from the world or reveal her secrets to those who dared to look closer. Bob Melton, Polly's husband, found himself adrift in a sea of uncertainty, his health and spirit diminished by the weight of her absence. Friends who had shared trails, laughter, and the simple pleasures of campground life now faced the empty space where Polly once stood, her presence irreplaceably void. The fabric of the community, so tightly knit around shared experiences and mutual affection, frayed at the edges, leaving those within it grappling with a loss that extended beyond the physical. The mystery of what happened to Polly Melton remains a question mark hanging over the Smoky Mountains. The story of her disappearance touched not just those who searched the woods and called her name, but also those who hear her story and felt the chill of the unresolved fate. The emotional toll exacted by Polly's vanishing was not measured in days of searching or miles traversed, but in the quiet moments of reflection, the birthdays and anniversaries that passed without her, and the haunting realization that some questions may remain forever unanswered. The legacy of Polly's disappearance is a story of love, loss, and the relentless pursuit of truth. If you have any information, no matter how small or seemingly insignificant, you are urged to come forward. In the quest for answers, every piece of the puzzle is crucial. It is through this collective effort that we may yet find the closure so deeply sought, not just for Polly's sake, but for those all touched by her story. Thank you. Stuart Isaac, a 48-year-old man, found himself ensnared in a mystery that would perplex and intrigue many. On September 24, 2010, he vanished into the vast wilderness of Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming, leaving behind nothing but whispers of his presence and a puzzle that begged to be solved. The disappearance was the culmination of a journey that had commenced 18 days prior on a seemingly ordinary day in Burtonsville, Maryland. Isaac had left a cryptic note for his family, a simple message that cloaked his true intentions in ambiguity. He announced he was setting out on a cross-country trip. This statement baffled everyone close to him, and it raised more questions than it answered. With the note as his only goodbye, he departed in his black 2009 Lexus IS250 westward, embarking on a 32-hour drive that would lead him straight into the heart of America's most beloved and mysterious national park. Was it a quest for solitude? an escape from the unseen burdens that life could no longer contain, or perhaps Yellowstone, with its geothermal marvels and untamed landscapes, had whispered his name, promising answers to questions he hadn't yet formed. The park, a vast expanse of natural beauty, has been known to both reveal and conceal secrets deep within its forests, gushing geysers, and expansive valleys. 
into this wilderness. Isaac disappeared, leaving behind the world he knew for reasons as mysterious as the land that swallowed him. His journey to Yellowstone was not just a trip. It was a voyage into the unknown, a pilgrimage towards something that perhaps even he couldn't fully articulate. As the wheels of the black Lexus turned, mile after mile, Isaac moved closer to his disappearance, to a fate that would become a story of questions, theories, and searches. The note he left, brief and to the point, hinted at a journey, but revealed nothing of the shadows that might have danced at its edges. It was a prelude to a story that would unfold in the vast wilderness of Wyoming, a narrative punctuated by the mysterious silence of his absence. Isaac's disappearance into Yellowstone was not just a missing persons case, it was a story that captured the imagination, a puzzle that lay hidden beneath the canopy of one of the most mysterious places on earth. On the morning of September 26th of 2010, with the vistas of Yellowstone National Park as a witness, an unsettling discovery was made at Craig Pass, a secluded spot far removed from the well-trodden hiking trails. There, Stuart Isaac's black 2009 Lexus IS-250 sat abandoned, a silent scene against the wilderness. The doors were unlocked with the keys resting inside, as if awaiting his return. This discovery set off a flurry of activity as the National Park Service launched a comprehensive search from both the skies and on the ground. Helicopters sliced through the air while search teams combed the underbrush, each step an effort to pierce the veil of mystery surrounding Isaac's disappearance. Craig Pass, known for its remote beauty and lack of trails, became the epicenter of a growing storm of questions and theories. Why was the car left in such a state? unlocked and ready, as though Isaac had stepped out for a moment, intending to return. The presence of his keys inside suggested a sudden departure, a moment of crisis or a decision that pulled him away from the safety of his vehicle. This place, far from the past frequented by tourists and hikers alike, hinted at a desire for solitude or perhaps an escape. The efforts of the National Park Service to find Isaac were met with silence. The park, vast and indifferent, gave up no clues, and Isaac remained missing. The search efforts, extensive and thorough, gradually wound down, leaving behind a haunting absence where a man once stood. The absence became a space filled with speculation, a narrative incomplete and waiting for an ending that had still not been written. Stuart Isaac's venture into the untamed heart of Yellowstone, despite his lack of experience as a hiker or outdoorsman weaves an even more intricate web of mystery around his disappearance. This detail paints a portrait of a man stepping far outside his comfort zone, propelled by motives that remain shrouded in the unknown. His last communication, a lengthy phone call to Matsu Evans, an old friend from high school residing in Guam, adds layer and depth to the complexity of this case. This call, made just two days before his vehicle would be found abandoned, was out of character for Isaac, who typically leaned on the immediacy of texts and emails to bridge the vast time zones between them. During this unusually long conversation, which was approximately two hours in length, Isaac revealed his imminent arrival at Yellowstone, a revelation that, in hindsight, casts a haunting shadow over their dialogue. The departure from their usual modes of communication suggests a profound need for connection, a desire to share or unburden before stepping into the vastness of the park. It hints at the weight of his journey, a prelude to his disappearance that was perhaps heavier with meaning than even Isaac could have articulated at the time. This final act of reaching out, choosing a voice call over the detached brevity of text, feels like a bridge across the silence that would soon surround his story. This detail of Isaac's story, a man not versed in the wild, yet drawn to one of the most wild places on earth, coupled with his final, out-of-character communication, threads complex questions and contemplations, leaving those who hear his story to wonder about the thoughts and emotions that propelled him into the heart of Yellowstone. Classified as lost, injured, and or missing, his story hovers on the edge of public consciousness, scarcely touched by the media spotlight or societal discourse. Isaac, a man whose heritage hails from the Pacific Islands, embodied a blend of characteristics not commonly woven into the fabric of such mysteries. 
with his dark hair, deep brown eyes, and a stature of approximately 5 foot 9 inches tall and weighing around 220 pounds. He was not the typical figure one imagines of disappearing into the wilderness. The tattoos adorning his right tricep and each shoulder blade, perhaps markers of personal stories or cultural heritage, and the possibility of a mustache on his face add layers to his appearance and identity. The silence surrounding his disappearance and the lingering absence of awareness cast a shadow over his narrative. It's as if Isaac, with his distinct appearance and untold stories inked onto his skin, stepped into a realm beyond the ordinary, into a narrative punctuated by the mysteries of nature itself. The lack of understanding about his motives for entering Yellowstone, a land of geothermal wonders and wild, untouched beauty, only deepens the intrigue and mystery. What drove a man, seemingly out of his element in the rugged outdoors, to seek something in the wilderness? Was it a quest for solitude, an escape, or a journey towards something undefinable? Isaac's story is a reminder of the many faces that disappear into the unknown, leaving questions behind that echo in the absence of answers. It speaks to the heart of human curiosity and the innate desire to understand why. Why did he go? What was he seeking? And ultimately, where has he gone? In the vast expanse of Yellowstone, amid its beauties and dangers, the story of Stuart Isaac remains a puzzle, a narrative suspended in the silence of the wild, waiting for a voice to bring it back into the light. The story of Dr. Sam Duball, a man whose disappearance in the wilds of Mount Rainier National Park has left a void in the hearts of those who knew him and a puzzle for those drawn to the mysteries of our natural world. Dr. Sam Duball was not just like any other hiker lost to the unpredictable whims of nature. He was a beacon of intellect and passion, a 33-year-old assistant professor at the University of Washington. His life was a testament to the pursuit of knowledge and the exploration of the vast, untamed wilderness. Sam's love for the outdoors was matched only by his academic rigor. A seasoned traveler, he had ventured through the rugged terrains of the Himalayas, where the earth touches the sky, seeking not just adventure, but a deeper connection with the world around him. But who was Dr. Sam Duball beyond the headlines and the search reports? Born with a thirst for understanding the human condition, Sam embarked on an educational journey that saw him graduating from Stanford, immersing himself in the rigorous medical curriculum at Harvard Medical School and ultimately earning a Ph.D. in medical anthropology from UC Berkeley. His academic pursuits were driven by a profound desire to unravel the complexities of humanity, to explore what binds us in our shared experience and what divides us in our individual struggles. Sam's work and research took him to the heart of Uganda, where he focused on the Lord's Resistance Army, a group as controversial as it is misunderstood. It was here, amidst the backdrop of conflict and resilience, that Sam found the inspiration for his book, Against Humanity, Lessons from the Lord's Resistance Army. This was not just another academic adventure. It was a bold critique of the very concept of humanity, challenging the foundation of human rights and humanitarian missions. Through his writing, Sam sought to illuminate the shadows of the human experience, to question the constructs that define our understanding of good and evil, right and wrong. His journey was not solely about exploring the external landscapes of our planet or the societal structures of distant cultures. It was about an inward quest, a relentless search for truth and meaning in a world that often seems devoid of both. Sam's work bridged the gap between the academic and the personal, inviting us to ponder the essence of our being and the paths we chose to navigate through the journey of life. As we explore the mystery of Dr. Sam Duball's disappearance, we are reminded of the fragility of human existence and the indomitable spirit of those who dare to question, to seek, and to dream. Sam's story is a reflection of our innate desire to connect with the world beyond the confines of our immediate reality, to venture into the unknown in pursuit of something greater than ourselves. In the silence of the mountains, where Dr. Duball walked, there echoes a call to each of us, a call to explore, to understand, and to cherish the profound mysteries of our universe. 
in a chapter that would introduce an unwelcome twist in the narrative of Dr. Sam Duval's life, October 9th of 2020 dawned with the promise of adventure. On this day, Sam embarked on what was to be a solitary journey through the serene landscape of Mount Rainier National Park, choosing the Mother Mountain Loop Trail as his path for exploration. The allure of the trail, with its breathtaking vistas and the tranquil solitude it offered, was irresistible to a soul as adventurous as Sam's. With his preparations complete and his spirits high, he set off into the heart of the wilderness, expected to return by the following day, October 10th. However, as the hours turned into days, an unsettling silence took hold. The man who had ventured into the embrace of nature did not return as anticipated. On the day of his departure, fellow hikers and nature enthusiasts reported spotting Sam near Lake Mowich, an area known for its stunning beauty and peaceful surroundings. This sighting would later mark the last known point of his presence in the vast expanse of the park. The realization that Sam had not returned on schedule prompted concern and action. By October 12th, with no word from Sam and no sign of his return, the alarming reality set in. He was missing. The absence of communication from him, a hiker, both experienced and well-prepared, ignited a flurry of worry among his family, friends, and the hiking community. The news of his disappearance spread rapidly, casting a shadow over the natural splendor of Mount Rainier. As the search for Sam Dubal began, so too did a chapter filled with uncertainty, hope, and the collective desire of a community seeking to find one of their own. In response to Sam Duball's disappearance, a concerted and extensive search operation was swiftly launched by the Mount Rainier National Park Service, drawing upon the dedication and expertise of both park rangers and a brigade of volunteers. This united effort saw the wilderness combed with meticulous care, as search teams navigated the rugged and diverse terrain of the park with the singular aim of locating Sam. Despite Sam's thorough preparation for his journey, which included a range of equipment designed to ensure his safety and comfort in the wilderness, the search yielded little in the way of clues. The discovery of a water bottle near the Loop Trail stood as the lone tangible link to Sam's path through the expansive natural landscape. This finding, though significant, did not lead to the breakthrough that the search teams and Sam's loved ones had hoped for. As the days passed, the operation faced mounting challenges. The weather, always a force in the high mountains, turned against the search efforts. Poor conditions hampered the ability of the teams to cover ground and thoroughly search potential areas where Sam might have been. Visibility was reduced, paths became treacherous, and the inherent risks of mountain search and rescue operations were magnified under such adverse weather conditions. With each passing day, Hope waned as the elements continued to obstruct the search. After several days of relentless effort, faced with the daunting reality of the situation and the unforgiving nature of the environment, the decision was made to suspend the operation. Sam was presumed dead, leaving a void in the hearts of those who knew him and a lingering question in the minds of those involved in the search. The decision marked a sad moment a pause in the physical search, but not an end to a quest for understanding as to what happened to Dr. Sam Duball on his hike in Mount Rainier National Park. Mount Rainier is a towering figure in the landscape of the Pacific Northwest. It stands as a sentinel over the surrounding terrain. This majestic peak, reaching an elevation of 14,411 feet, is not only the highest mountain in the state of Washington, but also one of the most iconic features of the Cascade Range. Beneath its serene appearance, however, lies the heart of an active volcano. Its potential for eruption places it among the most dangerous volcanoes in the world, a stark reminder of the raw power of nature. Over the years, Mount Rainier has witnessed its share of hiking accidents, each a testament to the mountain's unpredictable and perilous nature. Despite these dangers, or perhaps because of them, the mountain continues to draw adventurers and nature lovers to its slopes, each seeking to experience the awe-inspiring beauty and the thrill of the ascent. Nestled within this rugged and breathtaking landscape is the Mother Mountain Loop Trail, 
a journey through some of the park's most stunning and diverse terrains. The trail offers a glimpse into the heart of Mount Rainier National Park, winding its way through lush forests, alpine meadows, and past tranquil lakes. Starting from the Mowich Lake campground, the trail invites hikers to embark on a journey that is as beautiful as it is challenging. The route leads adventurers past the southeast side of Moak Lake, through the Knapsack Pass, and into the expansive beauty of Spray Park and Mist Park, areas renowned for their wildflowers and scenic vistas. Despite the inherent risks associated with any hike in such a rugged environment, the Mother Mountain Loop Trail is known for its relative safety, provided hikers are prepared and respect the mountain's conditions. The trail's design and the park's management have worked in tandem to create a route that, while challenging, avoids the most perilous aspects of mountain hiking. Yet, as with any wilderness expedition, the beauty of the trail is matched by the respect it demands for the natural forces that shape it. The legacy of Dr. Sam Duball extends far beyond the echoes of his footsteps on the Mother Mountain Loop Trail. His profound contributions to the fields of anthropology and medicine have left an indelible mark on the academic world and beyond. Sam was at the forefront of creating radical medicine, a pioneering field that sought to reimagine the practice of medicine through a lens of social justice and anti-racism. His vision for the healthcare system that not only heals but also addresses the root cause of inequality is a testament to his deep commitment to creating a better world. Sam's personal impact resonates through the heartfelt tributes from his family, colleagues, and the broad academic community. They speak of a man with an unwavering moral compass, whose life was dedicated to the pursuit of justice and the dismantling of racism within the medical field and society at large. His work, characterized by courage and unyielding dedication to his principles, continues to inspire those who were fortunate enough to know him and those who encounter his legacy. The mystery surrounding Sam Duball's disappearance has galvanized a community united in their desire for answers. Despite extensive search efforts and a petition by Sam's family urging the continuation of the search, no further evidence of his whereabouts has been uncovered. This has led to theories and eyewitness accounts speculating on the circumstances that may have led to his disappearance. Some hikers who have traversed the same trail ponder the possibility that Sam may have deviated from his intended path, leading to an unforeseen accident. The absence of concrete evidence only deepens the mystery and fuels the discussion about what could have transpired in the vast wilderness of Mount Rainier National Park. The impact of Sam's disappearance reverberates through his family, colleagues, and the wider community, leaving a void filled with memories of his passion, kindness, and the relentless quest for justice. The unresolved nature of his disappearance continues to be a source of pain and uncertainty, yet it also serves as a beacon of hope. Hope that one day, the answers that are sought will be found, bringing closure to those who loved him. Sam's story highlights the broader issue of missing persons in national parks and the inherent challenges faced by search and rescue operations. It underscores the need for continued awareness, preparedness, and resources to ensure the safety of those who venture into the wild. As we reflect on the legacy of Dr. Sam Duball and the ongoing mystery of his disappearance, we are reminded of the fragility of life, the strength of the human spirit, and the enduring hope for answers in the face of uncertainty. In the heart of the Grand Canyon National Park, a baffling mystery began to unfold on June 2nd of 2015. Morgan Elias Heimer, a 22-year-old river guide and University of Wyoming English student, embarked on what was supposed to be an adventurous journey down the Colorado River. An experienced outdoorsman and a superb swimmer, Morgan's skills were well suited for the rigors of river guiding. However, no one could have predicted the strange turn of events that would soon transpire. Working for Tor West, a commercial rafting company, Morgan was guiding a group on an eight-day rafting trip. They had successfully navigated six days of their journey, approaching the peculiar and picturesque Pumpkin Springs at mile marker 213 on the river. 
Known for its orange rock formations and warm waters laced with toxic metals, Pumpkin Springs presents a unique backdrop to the trip. On that fateful afternoon, around 4 p.m., as the group was near the cliff by Pumpkin Springs, Morgan spoke with the lead guide. He mentioned needing some personal time that afternoon, a request not uncommon in such settings. The guide, momentarily distracted by a client, turned away. When he looked back, Morgan had vanished without a trace. Initially, the guide assumed Morgan had taken his break, but as the evening approached and Morgan failed to reappear, concern grew. The group continued their activities, swimming in the river and gathering for dinner, but Morgan's absence became increasingly alarming. At 7.26 p.m., one of the group members reported him missing. The search for Morgan commenced immediately, spearheaded by park rangers and search and rescue teams. They scoured the river and surrounding areas, extending from mile markers 211 to 215 and eventually to Diamond Creek, 12 miles west of Pumpkin Springs. Despite his skill and experience, which led investigators to believe he had a high chance of survival if lost, the search yielded no results. Fellow employees from Tor West, clients on the river trip, and other river guides and their groups were interviewed, but no clues emerged. As days passed, the likelihood of finding Morgan grew dimmer. Theories about his disappearance ranged from a tragic accident in the river's rapids, a fall from a cliff, or even a deliberate decision to disappear. The lack of evidence left all possibilities open, turning Morgan's case into a perplexing and unsolved mystery. The Grand Canyon, with its vast and rugged terrain, has been known to conceal its secrets well. In Morgan's case, it seemed to have done just that. Whether he met an accidental fate in the Colorado River, became lost in the wilderness, or chose a path that led him away from the tour remains unknown. His disappearance continues to be a source of speculation and intrigue for those who hear his story. The days following Morgan Elias Hamer's disappearance saw an intense and exhaustive search, but the Grand Canyon, with its treacherous terrain and sprawling expanse, offered no clues. The search teams, experienced in navigating the challenging environment of the canyon, were baffled. Morgan, with his background as a seasoned outdoorsman and an excellent swimmer, was equipped with the skills to survive in such a setting, yet there remained no sign of him. The mystery deepened as those who knew Morgan pondered over his sudden and unexplained absence. Born and raised in Cody, Wyoming, Morgan had spent his life immersed in nature. His love for the outdoors was evident from an early age. His pursuit of an English degree at the University of Wyoming was balanced with his passion for the wilderness, leading him to a career as a river guide. This balance of academic pursuits and outdoor adventures defined Morgan, making his disappearance all the more perplexing. The circumstances of that day in 2015 were scrutinized for clues. Morgan's conversation with the lead guide about taking some time off, the guide's brief distraction, and Morgan's subsequent disappearance presents a baffling sequence of events. Questions arose about Morgan's state of mind and intentions. Was this a spur-of-the-moment decision to seek solitude or something more concerning? Without clear answers, speculation fills this void. As the search went on, theories varied. Some considered the possibility of an accidental fall into the river, a misstep on a treacherous canyon terrain, or an unfortunate encounter with the canyon's wildlife. Others contemplated more distressing possibilities, including the chance that Morgan might have been dealing with personal struggles, leading to a deliberate choice to walk away from his current life. Despite all these theories and speculations, the search teams remained focused on their mission. The area around Pumpkin Springs, known for its unique geographical features and the hazardous waters within, was thoroughly examined. The search extended to Diamond Creek, a remote location offering its own set of challenges. The efforts of the search teams, coupled with the interviews of those who were with Morgan on the trip, painted a picture of a young man in his prime element, yet who also mysteriously vanished. As the search was eventually scaled back, the absence of any definitive evidence left Morgan's fate uncertain. His description as a young man with a cross tattoo on his leg became a key point in the ongoing efforts to locate him. The community, both local and beyond, 
held on to hope even as the chances of finding Morgan alive diminished. In the years that followed, Morgan's disappearance remained a topic of discussion and intrigue among those who traversed the Grand Canyon. His story, a blend of adventure and mystery, became part of the canyon's lore, a tale of a young man who ventured into its depths and never returned. When Morgan Heimer was last seen, he was described as a white male standing six feet tall, weighing around 175 pounds, with blonde hair and blue eyes. Morgan was last seen wearing a dark-colored personal flotation device, a blue plaid long sleeve shirt, flip-flops, a maroon baseball cap, brightly colored shorts, and carrying a purple water bottle. To this day, what happened to Morgan Elias Hamer on the banks of the Colorado River is a question that lingers. The Grand Canyon, a place of majestic beauty and hidden dangers, keeps its secrets well. Whether Morgan's fate was a result of misadventure, a personal crisis, or something else entirely remains a mystery, a haunting reminder of the canyon's unpredictable nature. The mysterious disappearance of Michael Legas in Grand Canyon National Park presents a narrative filled with unanswered questions and a search operation that gripped the attention of both authorities and the public. Michael Legas, a 39-year-old man from Toole, Utah, vanished without a trace, prompting an exhaustive search and investigation by the National Park Service and igniting concern among those who knew him and the wider community fascinated by the nature of his disappearance. On a seemingly ordinary day, October 31st of 2017, Michael set out to explore the Grand Canyon, a natural wonder known for its breathtaking views and treacherous terrain. It was at Mather Point, a popular viewpoint on the canyon's south rim, where Michael was last seen at approximately 12.15 p.m. This location, known for its panoramic vistas, would become the center of a perplexing mystery. Dressed in a blue hooded sweatshirt and blue Levi jeans, Michael, standing six foot tall and weighing around 230 pounds, with brown and graying hair and hazel eyes, blended into the crowd of tourists and adventurers. Unbeknownst to those around him, this might have been the last time anyone would see Michael Legas alive. As hours turned into days, concern for Michael's whereabouts grew. A friend, alarmed by his absence, reported him missing to the park authorities, triggering an immediate response from the Grand Canyon Rangers. The National Park Service launched a comprehensive search operation, scouring the area at Mather Point and extending their efforts along the rim trail between Pipe Creek and Mather Point in hopes of finding any trace of Michael. The Park Service also reached out to the public, urging anyone who might have seen or spoken to Michael to come forward with information hoping that piece of the puzzle could lead them to his location. The search efforts, marked by a blend of hope and urgency, continued relentlessly until November 10th, when the grim discovery of a body below the south rim, along the rim trail, brought the operation to an end. The body, recovered by the National Park Service and believed to be that of Michael Legas, was transferred to the county medical examiner's office for identification and to conduct an investigation into the circumstances leading to his death. Michael's story, like many others who have gone missing in the grandeur and peril of the Grand Canyon, underscores the park's dual nature as a place of unparalleled beauty and inherent danger. The Grand Canyon, while inviting explorers and nature enthusiasts to immerse themselves in its splendor, also holds the potential for tragedy amidst its rugged cliffs and extreme weather conditions. Michael's disappearance and the subsequent discovery serves as a reminder of the respect and caution that such wild and unforgiving landscapes demand from those who venture into their depths. In 1978, Amidst a sprawling expanse of the Grand Canyon's rugged terrain, a story unfolded that would etch itself into the records of unsolved mysteries. Jeffrey Ridenauer, a 63-year-old, embarked on a journey into the heart of one of nature's most formidable landscapes. An experienced hiker from Southern California, Jeffrey sought refuge from the monotony of urban life, yearning for the freedom and challenge offered by the vast wilderness. The Grand Canyon, a marvel of geological history and testament to the raw power of natural forces, was the backdrop for Jeffrey's ambitious trek. He planned to navigate the south rim of the canyon, a route he had braved only once before. 
His preparation was meticulous. He parked a station wagon in the Tanner Trails parking lot and had a bicycle strategically placed at the New Hance Trails end. Jeffrey's journey was to span between these points, traversing the Colorado River's banks, climbing cliffs, and navigating ledges that have witnessed eons of history. A note left on his bicycle served as a silent testament to his intentions. Hiking the canyon will be out by May 28th. It was a promise to the world and himself, a declaration of his resolve to conquer the challenges that lay ahead. However, the canyon, with its vast expanse of rock, sand, and silence, seemed to defy this very notion of life and death, swallowing up tales of those who dared to traverse its paths. Despite receiving a backcountry permit marked with caution due to his limited canyon hikes, Jeffrey's confidence in his physical capabilities persuaded the issuing ranger. The warnings of extreme temperatures, which had soared above 115 degrees, did little to deter him. The ranger, noting Jeffrey's articulate assurance and the heavy snowfall that winter which promised more water sources, reluctantly agreed to this journey. As the days passed, Jeffrey's absence became a growing concern. The permit he was supposed to return went unsubmitted, prompting a search that would soon reveal the mysterious disappearance of his vehicle. Initially absent from its designated spot, the Dodge Dart station wagon reappeared, suggesting a return that only deepened the mystery. Rangers speculated that Jeffrey might have come back to resupply, embarking once again into the canyon's depths. The subsequent search operation, launched on June 4th, was unprecedented in scale at the time. Over 50 ground searchers combed the terrain, helicopters circled overhead, and rappelling teams scoured the cliffs and ledges for any sign of Jeffrey. Yet, the canyon remained silent, offering no clues to his whereabouts. The discovery of a pair of glasses and a razor, meticulously placed on a rock near one of Jeffrey's supposed campsites, provided a fleeting hope, yet even these could not be definitively linked to him. As the search extended, covering over a hundred square miles of canyon country, the realization dawned that Jeffrey might never be found. The vastness of the Grand Canyon, with its myriad of hiding places and relentless flow of the Colorado River, seemed to have claimed another soul. Rangers contemplated the futility of scuba searches in the river's treacherous waters, resigning themselves to the likelihood that Jeffrey's remains would only surface with time, if at all. The mystery of Jeffrey Rittenauer's disappearance remains unsolved, a narrative lost to the echoes of the Grand Canyon. Despite one of the largest search operations in the park's history, no conclusive evidence has surfaced, leaving only speculation and unanswered questions. The lack of a single photograph or definitive clue has rendered Jeffrey's story a ghostly presence in the canyon's lore. Decades have passed since Jeffrey ventured into the Grand Canyon, never to be seen again. His story, one of adventure, ambition, and the unfathomable mysteries of nature, lingers as a cautionary tale. It reminds us of the canyon's indomitable spirit and the fine line between humanity's quest for adventure and the immutable forces of the natural world. Jeffrey Ridenour, in his pursuit of solitude and challenge, became a part of the Grand Canyon's mystique a symbol of eternal dance between man and the wild, where some steps are forever lost in the shadows of towering cliffs and the roaring sound of the river below. In the quiet, coastal community of Gulf Breeze, Florida, the disappearance of 23-year-old Adam Clayton Lyle Jones in the spring of 2011 began as a simple departure from Florida and evolved into a profound mystery. Adam's story, characterized by inexplicable decisions and a sudden vanishing, continues to haunt those seeking answers. On a seemingly ordinary day, March 31st of 2011, Adam left his home. His retreat was marked by a peculiar lack of preparation. While most would carry essentials for a long trip, Adam took only his laptop, leaving behind his cell phone and other personal items. This choice painted the first stroke of mystery in Adam's case. Why embark on a lengthy journey with such minimal belongings? Adam's mode of transportation, a 1986 Oldsmobile sedan, was easily recognizable. It was light blue with a distinctive dark blue vinyl top and missing hubcaps. The car itself was later found abandoned. 
This would become a significant clue in unraveling the mystery of his whereabouts. The discovery of Adam's car was made by a ranger at the Grand Canyon Visitor Center on May 5th of 2011, over a month after his departure. This was the moment Adam's disappearance transformed from a family concern into a broader puzzle. Inside the vehicle, an itinerary revealed plans seemingly uncharacteristic of an impromptu trip. It listed destinations in Denver, Colorado, and various cities in California, suggesting a route that Adam had possibly planned with care. The car's location at the Grand Canyon's south rim added layers to the mystery. The canyon, known for its vast and imposing landscape, seemed an unlikely destination for Adam, given the absence of personal effects or preparation for a trek in such challenging terrain. Why was Adam drawn to this iconic yet daunting location? Was the Grand Canyon a planned destination or merely a stop along a route dictated by an unknown purpose? Attempts to trace Adam's movements led to a trail of transactions across Louisiana and Texas, as indicated by his debit card. Yet, these traces provided no insights into his intentions or state of mind. A potential lead, a friend in Yuma, Arizona, yielded no new information, deepening the intrigue surrounding this journey. Adam's physical description was widely circulated. A young man with short brown hair, blue eyes, possibly sporting facial hair, and with distinct heavy eyebrows. His casual attire, consisting of a t-shirt, jeans, and tennis shoes, was more suited for a day out rather than a voyage into the wilderness of the Grand Canyon. This mismatch between his apparent destination and his preparedness added to the puzzling nature of this disappearance. The case took an even more baffling turn with the complete lack of communication. Adam's decision to travel without a cell phone meant that there were no digital breadcrumbs to follow, a rarity in the age of electronic communication. The lack of any digital or personal trail after his departure from Florida only compounded the mystery. The situation left Adam's family, friends, and the authorities grappling with numerous unanswered questions. What led Adam to embark on this journey? What was the significance of the destination marked on his itinerary? And most crucially, what happened to him after his car was found abandoned at one of the nation's most renowned natural landmarks? As time passed, the mystery of Adam Clayton Lyle Jones's fate continues to perplex those who knew him and those who later became acquainted with his story. The circumstances of his disappearance, the unexplained nature of his travel plans, and the puzzling discovery of his abandoned car at the Grand Canyon form a narrative that is as confounding as it is intriguing. Adam's case remains a mystery, unsolved and puzzling, leaving a lingering question mark over the events of the spring of 2011 at the Grand Canyon. <laughs>